Hey guys, it's Mario here from iHustle and today I'll be using a real life example to show you how to register a limited company in the UK via this step-by-step -step video. I'm sure most of you know there's plenty of ways of registering a limited company with varying price and timescales, but today I'll be showing you how to register a company using the gov.uk website. It's by far the most direct and safest method by safest, I mean that your payment details are only being shared with gov.uk, your email is safe so you won't be spammed by promotional emails, and most importantly, during the application with gov.uk, you're actually urged to check your company name against existing trademarks, and I'll explain the benefits of that throughout this video. So there's a few things we need to know when registering a limited company in the UK and I'll be discussing these before going through the live example. Some of the things we'll be covering are what a limited company actually is, what an SIC code is and how to choose the correct one, the roles and responsibilities of a director, a secretary and a shareholder are, the timescales involved with registering a limited company. I'll also be discussing business bank accounts, what one might be the right one for you, accountants, what to be wary of and how to find a decent one. I'll also be discussing your company name and the various addresses involved with an, an application. Before we start, I'd like to say if you find the video helpful, then like the video. If you want to stay tuned with more tips and tricks, then please subscribe to my channel so I can keep these videos coming, keep sharing this knowledge. But most importantly, if you have any questions, then drop them in the comment section below. So the first thing to know is what is a limited company? A limited company is a separate entity formed by directors and shareholders. So it's literally like another person and is treated completely separately from its owners. Any assets the company has belong to the company and not you personally. So in layman's terms, this means that if the company gets sued or has debt that it can't pay back or gets itself into any sort of trouble, as long as you weren't taking part in fraudulent activities, then that company is treated as, as its own separate entity. So whoever is suing the company will only be able to come off the company's assets and not your personal assets. Hence the word limited, it has limited liability. Next thing to know is what is an SIC code and how do we pick the correct one? SIC stands for Standard Industrial Classification and it's basically a way for classifying industries by a four digit code. It's used to identify which industry you're in and is also used for tax purposes, particularly when it comes down to VAT. And guys, keep your eyes peeled over the next month or so, I'll be releasing a video on everything there is to know about VAT and how you can save up to 20,000 pounds by playing your cards right when it comes down to registering for the correct type of VAT. So getting back to the SIC code, it's important to choose the, the right one for your business to avoid having any issues with the HMRC in the future, which could end up with further costs. I mean, not, none of this is gonna put you out of business, but they're kind of, it's these kind of small things you wanna set up the business correctly at the start, so you don't have to mess about with um, changing things later on because everything's gonna come at a cost. So. Choosing the correct SIC code at the start, as I said, it will save you some time and money, um, particularly when it comes down to registering for either VAT or flat rate VAT down the line. For example, if you exceed the annual VAT threshold of £85,000 and need to register for flat rate VAT, your rate will be determined by the SIC code. Um, of course, if it's incorrect, then you don't need to panic. Your accountant or yourself, if you know what you're doing, can quite easily change your company's SIC code. But of course, it just takes time. Um, accountant's time don't usually come free, so it would probably just cost you a bit of extra money for that. And another situation where choosing the right SIC code is very important is if you're starting an investment company where you're looking at buying or renting houses through an investment business particularly because if you started a new limited company most banks will ask for at least two years of records before you can get a loan off them a substantial loan anyway if you've picked the right sic code and your company is an investment firm then banks will have no issue with lending you money they'll just do some extra checks on you 
next thing to discuss is the business structure and roles within the business. So when you're setting up a limited company in the UK, you're asked to assign three roles, which are directors, shareholders, and company secretaries. However, the company secretary is an optional role and the duties of the company secretary will and must be performed by the company director if there is no company secretary. So don't worry if you don't have a personal assistant or company secretary and we'll get onto their duties in a minute. In most cases, when you're starting up um, as an individual opening a limited company, you'll be the 100% shareholder and the sole director carrying out the duties of the company secretary. So if we move on to the roles now, the director is responsible for running the business. They call the shots and operate the business on day to day, week to week, month to month. The shareholders own the business. It's important to note that if you try and pay yourself dividends, you must be a shareholder. It's, it, you can't pay a director dividends if they don't hold shares in the business. There's a common misconception with that. Um, however, if you do pay a director dividends without them owning shares in the company or the business, um, then it may end in fines or, or legal action. So make sure you only pay dividends to yourself or to anyone else if you or they hold shares in the business. The role of the company secretary or director if you don't have a company secretary is basically just responsible for paperwork such as submitting forms at company's house, um, potentially doing the confirmation statement at the end of the year and those sorts of things. When you're setting up a company structure and assigning roles, you'll be asked to assign each shareholder a number of shares which you'll create. I think the default is one, um, but I would always create 100 shares just to future-proof the business, even if you assign yourself all of the roles. This makes it a little easier if you want to sell off part of the business or get someone else involved in the future. If you haven't done this and you've already set up, set up a limited company, then don't worry, you can always do this at a later stage. It will just take you more time and money as usually when you do things, um, when you don't set things up properly. Once you've submitted your application with Companies House, it will take approximately 24 hours for your application to go live if there are no issues. The rate of success is very high and there will generally only be issues if Companies House can't verify your identity or someone else has registered the same company name as you over the past 24 hours, which is highly unlikely as you can imagine. Once your company goes live, the next thing you'll need to do is open a business bank account. Because a limited company is a separate entity, you won't be able to use your personal bank account for trading. You'll need to open up a complete separate business bank account, which will take somewhere around 10 business working days. Um, so the whole process from applying to waiting for your company to go live and opening up a bank account will take you somewhere between 10 to 15 days. In the meantime, find yourself an accountant, which could probably take you not, a couple of days um, so you're looking at about two weeks in total. Opening a business bank account is quite easy and it's pretty much the same, if not just a little more thorough than the process you had to go through when opening a personal bank account. You'll need to present various documents such as identity, proof of address, some business documents like certificate of incorporation, articles of, of association, and all of those business documents you can download for free from Companies House. So if anyone's trying to charge you for that, certainly don't. Um, and choose your bank account wisely, preferably a bank that's protected by FSCS. So your funds are protected up until £85,000. And if you're going to be holding a lot of funds immediately, then find a bank that's been around for a very long time that isn't going to be going anywhere anytime soon. But do remember that traditional banks that have been around for ages generally charge quite a lot for currency exchange. So if you're going to be regularly dealing with suppliers outside of the UK, then a digital bank may be more suited to you as they offer much, much cheaper currency conversions. Some of them even give you the live rate. I started off using PayPal a while ago and it was such a terrible mistake. They have a terrible, terrible, terrible currency conversion and they also charge you a, a few percent in fees. So the whole thing ends up ended up costing about 
5% per transaction. And believe me, that adds up over, over the course of a year. I'll be adding some links to various challenger banks and digital banks in the video's description. So feel, feel free to check them out. Um, you can even use a combination of traditional banks and, and digital banks for the currency conversion if you want your funds protected. I know Metro Bank RFS CS protected, but Revolut aren't. The other benefit of using these challenger banks and digital banks is that they have quite a few widgets, which makes it very simple to integrate with management tools like Xero, Sage, Slack, and a few other accounting softwares. As well. It's not free, but it doesn't cost a lot. So it costs £12 to register a limited company. Each year, you need to submit an annual confirmation statement, which basically um, confirms any changes to your business, shareholders, directors, addresses, and that sort of thing. And that costs £13 a year. Other than that, your only other costs will be associated with an accountant if you get one, which I highly advise, and I'll speak about that next and also your business bank account, particularly the traditional banks, they usually cost somewhere around five pounds per month, but you'll probably be, be able to get some um, decent deals out there at the moment. So now we've moved on to speaking about accountants. My favorite part when it comes to limited companies, it's not actually a legal requirement for a limited company to have an accountant, although I would personally heavily, heavily, heavily advise anyone who's starting a limited company to find an, a decent accountant. Depending on your annual revenue and the complexity of your business, a decent accountant will cost you between one to 2,000 pounds per year. When starting a company, this sounds like a lot of money, and it is, particularly when you're not making any money yet. And hence, you may be inclined to find you know, a cheaper service, uh, an accounting software like QuickBooks. But if you're registering a limited company, then I would highly recommend finding a suitable accountant who has knowledge or experience in your industry. Using an accountant who knows your industry can end up saving you tens of thousands of pounds in the mid to long term once you get to the point where you're earning enough to be able to save that much money. If you're planning on just building a company for some extra cash on the side, then you might not need to be advised, in which case you, you could just, you know, you could potentially just use a, an accounting software to do your accounts if you're happy to just um, kind of earn a consistent income. However, if your aspirations are bigger than that and you'd like to grow an absolute beast of a company which may employ people one day and do business internationally, then hire an accountant who's done it before and is able to advise you can certainly be one of the most valuable aspects of your business. I know it was for me. When searching for an accountant, don't just look at their annual fees, but ask them if they have any clients um, and experience in, in your industry and whether they're happy to advise you as part of the fees that they're telling you they're gonna be charging you. You can either find an accountant through word of mouth or searching online, it doesn't really matter, but either way, make sure you get some feedback before making a final decision. Have a conversation with whoever has recommended them if it has been free word of mouth, just to make sure that they have enough time to advise you properly and have calls with you when needed. Or if it was online, then again, get some feedback online, find some Google reviews, Trustpilot reviews, forums, and, and so on. Find an accountant, be sure to ask them to meet up briefly, go to their office if you can, or if they live miles away from you, then call them, have a Zoom call, um, and just have a chat with them, suss them out, make a decision on whether you think they're someone you will get on with and rely on when you need to ask them um, for advice. They're not just kind of relying on you for your business, you need to be relying on them for their business as well. You need to rely on them on what they can bring to the table. Starting out as a newbie in a new industry, if this is the first time you're opening a limited company, um, they can seriously add a hell of a lot of value. So make sure you find the right one. If you don't wanna trade straight away, you don't have to. You might wanna register a limited company just because you wanna secure the name before someone else registers it. However, your company can remain dormant, which means it's not trading for as long as you wish. If your company is dormant, you'll still need to submit your accounts for each year, but because there's no calculations, 
You won't necessarily need an accountant for this and you can call HMRC for advice on how to do it and which forms to fill out and so on. It's essentially just gonna be zeros in all of the available boxes. So you won't need to worry about paying someone an extortionate amount of money just to do that. So the second to last thing we're gonna be speaking about before we start our step-by-step -step application are addresses. So when we're registering a limited company in the UK, we're asked for two addresses and that's registered office address and your trading address. So to distinguish between the two of them, the trading address is simply the address where you'll be operating the business. For instance, if you're running a business online from your house, then your trading address will be your home address. If you're starting a manufacturing business on the other hand, then your trading address will be where your factory is based. Another thing to note is that the trading address is the address you should be using when issuing invoices or receiving correspondence from your clients. You can also on invoices write your registered office in small print in the foot somewhere, but the receiving address will be your trading address. So moving on to your registered office, this is an official address for the limited company where legal documents from company's house will be going to. So it needs to be a reliable address where you won't miss post basically. Your registered office address is also the address which will be publicized in company's house register and it can and might be the same as your home address if you're operating a business from your house and you don't have a separate address, um, a separate office to use. If you're a private person and you really don't want your, your um, home address to be listed on the company's house register, then do note that you can always use your accountant's office if you ask them, or you can pay for a virtual address. And for those of you that don't know what a virtual address is, essentially you can rent an address annually somewhere between 50 to 150 pounds, depending on the location, and all of your correspondence will be sent to that address and then you can pay for a, a mail forwarding service for them to then forward your mail onto your home address. So Companies House will have this virtual address. Um, there's plenty of them in, in London, Old Street, for instance. So you'll be paying for that address. Companies House will be sending your documents to that address. That address will also be listed on Companies House's register and that whoever's operating the business at that address, that virtual address, will then be forwarding your mail to your home address. And that is a pretty decent way of keeping everything private and also giving your business a bit more of a professional, I keep doing that, a bit more of a professional character. Okay, so we're down to the last step we're gonna discuss before moving on to the step-by-step -step video. Company name. There's a common misconception that you can protect your business name from being used by others simply by registering the name at Company's House. Unfortunately, this isn't the case. By forming a new company at Company's House, you're only preventing other businesses from registering the same name or a very similar name. Unless your company or brand name are registered trademarks, they may be used by other businesses for marketing or other purposes. Not everyone who registers a business wants to use their business name as their brand name. So you guys who fit into that category will just be able to register any company name as long as it hasn't been registered with Companies House before and then trademark a different brand name at a later stage. For those who do want to use the company name as their brand name, you need to register a trademark if you want any level of protection. Fortunately for you, I've already done a step-by-step -step video on how to trademark, which should pop up any moment now. And I'll also add a link to that video in this video's description. Do make sure that you watch that whole video because it explains how to successfully register a trademark even if somebody has already trademarked the same word whilst minimizing the chances of somebody opposing your application, which is a thing when it comes down to registering a trademark. Once you've selected your company name and brand name if required, then you're ready for registering a limited company. Let's go. The first thing we want to do is open up the gov.uk website by typing register a limited company. Reg 
registered limited company. And then we want to scroll down to this link here. It says gov.uk limited company formation. And then just scroll down until you see the register now button. Before we do that, I'll just point out that you need at least three pieces of personal information about yourself and your shareholders. You'll also need £12, which you can either pay by debit or credit card or a PayPal account. If you don't have a PayPal account and can't pay by debit or credit card, then all you need to do is Google NIO1 form and you can follow the link down here, register a private or public company, and then you've got this INO1 application paper form, which you can fill out. It's exactly the same as the online form but you'll just be able to fill that out and post it off with a check. Another thing to note is that before you crack on with the application, you'll be prompted to make a government gateway user ID. And for those of you that have been registered as sole traders before, it's not the same government gateway user ID. You will need a completely different ID per company. So we'll be making a new one. So let's crack on. Are you starting a new application? Yes. And here you'll just be asked a couple of questions so that company's house can verify that this is the service that you want. So yes, we'll be paying by card or PayPal. Is the new company taking over another business? No, not in my case. You only wanna click yes here if you're buying another limited company or changing either a sole trader business or partnership business into a limited company. If you're starting a new business, then you just wanna click no here. Are any directors or persons with significant control on the company's house secure register? Persons with significant control basically means anyone that has more than 25% of the shares. And you can see here that the secure register is for victims of threatening behavior or violence. You cannot risk having their home address information on the public register. But not in my case. And as mentioned earlier, now you, you're gonna to need to make a government gateway user ID. And for those of you that don't know, the government gateway user ID is used so you can file your confirmation statement at the end of each year, which basically confirms any changes to your business or if your business details have stayed the same. So I'll just type in my personal email address here, and then I should get a confirmation email these emails come really quickly, literally instantly they pop up. So you can just copy that confirmation code and pop it over here. And that's it. And here, from this point onwards, we essentially just want to follow the steps. I was actually listening to an article the other day and apparently the most secure everyday passwords you could come up with are three random words back to back. So I'm just going to think of one now I can use that as an example. I haven't actually used that yet. Okay, so this is my government gateway user ID. They've sent a confirmation of this to my email, but I'm just gonna copy that and save it anyway. And then we can crack on. I'm just gonna use my personal email for this. So this is asking you, what is your relationship to the company? Are you gonna be a company director or are you, for instance, doing this application for a friend? If you are, then what's your relationship to the company? In my case, I'll be a company director. So as you can see here, it says, this is a special type of company that exists to benefit the community. If you're creating a limited company for the sake of making profit, then click no here and continue. In most cases, if you're making a limited company here for business purposes and to make profits, then you want to limit by shares. You only really want to click limited by guarantee if you're a non-profit organization like a charity. So here you can type your company name and once you click save and continue, it will tell you if that company name is available. So don't worry about the company name clashing with anyone else after you've submitted the application. So whether you pick limited or LTD here, it's literally just a different in appearance and doesn't make any difference to your business. I'm just gonna pick LTD because it's easier to type. 
So it says here, what is the company's registered office address? And we spoke about that earlier. This is the address that's gonna be publicly available on the company's house online register. So for this example, I'm just gonna pick a virtual address, which I signed up to earlier. And that's EC1V9BD, and that's 130. Yep. Where will the company be registered? So I'll be registering the company in England and Wales, but it does say here that the company must be registered in the same part of the UK as its registered office address. So the only time to be careful here is if you're using a virtual address, make sure it's in the same part of the UK as your company. What is the company's principal place of business? Now this is the exact same as the trading address that we mentioned earlier, it's just different terminology. As you can see here, this address won't go on the public record. It's only the registered office address that will, that one. And since I've used a virtual address, I can't be trading a virtual address, so I'm gonna to have to pick a different address. And I use the trading address for here, which will be my home address. I probably will have to gray these out earlier so I don't get any hate mail or love mail to be fair. Okay, so this is just asking for more contact information in case the HMRC needs to contact you for corporation tax. So we've mentioned before that you don't have to start trading straight away. You've got three options here. On the same date as it gets set up, so that basically means you'll be trading as soon as the business goes live on company's house or on a future, on a different future date. So that might be, you know, X amount of days, weeks or months in advance. If you have absolutely no plans to start trading yet and you just want to kind of secure the company name, that you might potentially use the business in a few years time, then you can select that option. Also, if you select this option here, it does say that you'll get a letter explaining how to tell HMRC when the company becomes active. In my case, I want to start trading as soon as it gets set up. The first three months, will the company do any of the following? Pay interest on any non-bank loans, no, make royalty payments or receive interest or dividend payments from overseas investments. 99% of you won't be doing that. So let's just click no here. And now we've gone on to the SIC code. So this is actually a pretty decent search function here. You can literally start typing any keywords and it will give you some suggestions. In my case, I'll be using the company to rent out property. So I'm going to just type in here estate you can see here other letting and operating with own or leased real estate so i'll be using that for all of the people that are starting online businesses here type in retail and the codes you want to be looking for is retail sale via mail order houses or via internet it's 47910 for me other letting and operating with real estate if you know your business is going to be partaking in different activities, then make sure you add them. Again, it's important you add them now. So you don't have to waste time and money down the line changing things around. If you're running an online business, but you've also got a shop to be flogging the same items, then you want to pick that code that I showed you earlier, plus whatever else is suitable for the type of shop you'll be running. In my case, it will literally just be leasing real estate. So I'm just going to continue there. Has anyone on this application ever sent a secure register form to ask companies house for protection? You'd know if you've done that. If not, then you can click no here. And now we're going to be filling out the details. So I'll be filling out my details here. No. What is a correspondence address for Mario Gabriel? As mentioned earlier, this is a virtual address and I'll be asking them to forward mail to my personal address. All of my letters will be going to this address, which is the virtual address. And I've signed up for a mail forwarding service, which means the guys at this address will be sending the letters to my address, to my personal address. 
So that was my virtual address. I'm gonna to need to type in my home address now. Do I want to receive filing reminders by email? 100% yes. It only costs 13 pounds to, to fill out your confirmation statement. I'll just use my personal email for that. Now we just want to confirm our details, name, birthday, yeah. So I'll type on so on. And then you just want to select these here. So now we've completed the directors of the business and we've moved on to the shareholders. And it tells you here what they're going to ask, who the company's shareholders are and how many shares you want to give them and give each share a value. Since I'm the sole director and 100% shareholder, I'm going to click yes here. In some cases, you might just be a director and not a shareholder. So you would select no there and then you'd list out the shareholders. But in some cases, you might have had investment from a family member, say a brother, he's invested in your business. So you're going to make him a 50% shareholder, but he doesn't necessarily want to be involved with operating the business. So you're going to be the director and 50% shareholder and he'll just be a shareholder. So you select yes there and just add him as a shareholder. On this page, don't panic if you see a different address here than your home address. This is the registered office address, but it hasn't really made it clear there because it says what's the address for Mario Gabriel, which implies your home address, but that is the registered office address, so it's correct in this case. Do you want to use the most common type of shares? 99.9% .9 of us will say yes here. There's a very small proportion of people that can select no here, and you'll have the option of picking a different type of shares. So there's a share called ordinary A shares, and that basically gives the shares a different value to the ordinary shares. The only situation I can see this being applicable to is if a company goes public and the directors want to maintain control of the business, but they want to sell some shares off to generate funds. In this case, we'll be selecting yes. Earlier on in the video, when we're speaking about company structure, there's a default of one share, but let's pick other amount and type in a hundred here. So if we assign 100 shares here, we're going to future proof the business in case anyone else wants to get involved or we want to leave some inheritance to our kids and that sort of thing. Now here it says choose a value for each share. This has no association with the value of the company. It's just the nominal value of each share, which doesn't reflect the true market value of the share or company i.e. what the company is actually worth in monetary terms if it was ever valued or sold. In our example, we're issuing 100 shares, each of which have a nominal value of one penny. So the company's share capital would only be worth one pound, but the market value of the shares could be worth 300,000 pounds if it was sold, making each share worth 3,000 pounds. The only point where this nominal value comes into play is if the company becomes insolvent. In other words, it doesn't have enough money to pay for its debt, then the shareholders must contribute the nominal value of the shares they hold, and this is known as their limited liability to the company. So to give you an example, if you create 100 shares worth £10 each, giving the company a nominal value of £1,000, then you need to pay £1,000 if the company ever becomes insolvent. Hence why we're going to give ourselves a nominal value of £1. But since we have 100 shares, we'll type in one penny in the box, and we'll move on to the next step. So I've got 100 shares at a penny each. The total value of one pound, perfect. You're about to set up the persons with significant control over the company. If you ever see PSC anywhere, that's what it means. And it's basically anyone with 25% of the company's shares. Because I've set myself up as a 100% shareholder, this should automatically clock onto that and not ask me for any more names. If we continue here, there you go. Does Mary Gabriel have the right to appoint or remove the majority of company directors? 100% yes. The only applicable situation I can see anyone clicking no here is if your company's just bought another public company, you're a director in the buying company, the company shareholders and board are not going to want you to have the rights to remove other company directors. They'll probably ask you to click no here. In my situation, 
I'm the sole director and sole shareholder, so I'll click yes there. Check and confirm details. So yeah, I've checked all of that and just want to crack on. We mentioned articles of association earlier very, very briefly, and it's essentially the rules for directors and shareholders about how to run the company. So if you're like me and you've just set up a company, you don't need any specialized rules, you're gonna select yes here. You'll just use the model one. You can click on it and read it. However, if you've set up a company and it's gonna be complicated, you've got various shareholders, various directors, and you've made some sort of specialized agreements, then you'll probably wanna write your own ones. So you'll click no there and it will give you an opportunity to upload your own. In most cases, you'd wanna click yes here, save and continue. And now we're essentially just confirming that we wanna form a company, click yes there. So remember we mentioned at the start, you need three pieces of personal information for shareholders. And I'm just gonna select mother's main name, father's name, and national insurance number. So already saved that in there. First three letters. So you can see here, it's just the first three letters. And in this, in the national insurance number, it's the last three characters. So save and continue. Now we wanna just check and confirm our answers. Yeah, continue. And again, checking and confirming some answers we've given earlier. Make sure you go through these properly. I'm just gonna skim over these, but make sure you go through them properly because again, it's just gonna be time and hassle and money if you've got anything wrong. And now we're ready. And once we get onto this page, just make a note of your submission number. It's basically just a reference number you can quote if there's any issues with your application. When we click make a payment, it will take us to a page where we can either select card payment or PayPal. And once we enter our details, our application will be sent to company's house and processed. Your application will actually be sent to company's house whether or not you make payment, but of course your application won't be processed until your payment clears. So I'd suggest you're signing into your payment method and ensuring the funds have left your account. If not, then maybe just call your bank or PayPal to double check what's wrong. Brilliant, we've managed to register a limited company in the UK, get in. Guys, thank you so, so much for listening. If you enjoyed the video or found it helpful, then make sure you like and subscribe to my channel so we can keep these videos coming, keep sharing the knowledge. But most importantly, if you have any comments, then drop them in the comment section below and I'll get answering as soon as I can. Until next time, guys, take care.